everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a solved case from England. In the spring of 2009, the community in the county of Hertfordshire were shocked and terrified when a truly gruesome discovery was made in their area. It was a severed human limb. Of course, with this discovery came countless questions. Who had disposed of it at this location? Who had this limb come from? But there was barely any time to even process this news before a second body part was found and then a third, and then a four. Over the coming weeks, several body parts were discovered. They had just been scattered across different locations, and sickeningly, with each discovery, it was almost like the police were putting together a jigsaw of this deceased individual. Join me as we delve into the twisted case of the jigsaw killer. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Wild for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now obviously it is the start of a brand new year. We are in January now, which for a lot of people, including myself, means New Year's resolutions. And I'm not really the type to set myself any kind of huge unrealistic goals because I just know for a fact that I will not stick to them. For me, it's more about coming up with small goals, small changes that I can make to my everyday life just to make it a bit better. And this year, I really hope to try and be a bit more sustainable. And that is where Wild comes in. Wild are a company that makes natural and refillable bathroom products, which can be delivered straight to your door. Their products are made from natural ingredients. They have no aluminium salts, parabens, or sulfates, and all of their formulas are vegan and cruelty free. I've recently been using their deodorants and shower gels which contain no single use plastic and they come in these gorgeous premium reusable cases with compostable refills and you can even personalise the cases and get your name printed on them which I think is just so cute and let me tell you their products just smell divine. I've got the scent linen and lilac for my deodorant right now which for me just feels like the perfect January scent. If I had to describe January as a smell, it would be this because it just smells so fresh, like a fresh new year. But I've also got two refillables in the scent coconut and vanilla and jasmine and mandarin blossom, which oh my god, also smell amazing. So I cannot wait to switch up and use these two. And I'm also currently using their mint and aloe vera shower gel as well, which again is a very nice, cool, and refreshing smell. It keeps me feeling fresh throughout the day. And what's even more incredible about Wild is that they have part with On A Mission, a reforestation organisation, and every single time you buy from them, they pledge to plant a tree. So if it's one of your goals in 2024 to become a bit more mindful about your plastic waste and be more sustainable, then I could not recommend using Wild enough. And if you use the code 20MOLLY, you will be able to receive 20% off of your first purchase. And this code can also be used on Wild's monthly subscription service on your first subscription order if you want to sign up to that. Thank you once again to Wild for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to all of you guys watching for supporting the sponsors on this channel. And now let's just get into the case. So for this week's case, we are going back, coming up to 15 years ago now, to March of 2009 in Southgate, which is an area located in North London in England. Although actually our case doesn't begin in Southgate, it begins in a little village in Hertfordshire called called Cotterhead, which is about 33 miles away from North London. It was Sunday the 22nd of March 2009 when a local farmer in Cotterhead began work on his family's farm for the day. He got on his tractor and he started driving up and down their fields. They owned quite a big farm so there was a lot of land for him to cover. And when he got to the edge of one particular field close to the main road, he noticed something. He noticed a bag, this like green 
green colored holdall bag. Now the farmer didn't really think much of it at the time, but he just kind of made a mental note of it in his head so that he remembered to come back later and take a closer look. So some hours later, he did return to this field and he went closer to this green bag. He unzipped it and inside there was some kind of object which had been wrapped up in this blue polythene plastic bag secured with duct tape. So the farmer put his hand in and he started feeling this object, poking it, and he described how it felt almost squidgy. And I think it was then when he just had a really bad feeling about this bag. The fact that it had clearly just been ditched at the edge of his field. The fact that whatever was inside of it, this object had been tightly wrapped up so that it was concealed. It all just seemed very suspicious to him. And so he thought that it would be best if he called the police and reported this discovery. So police officers were dispatched to the area of this field where the bag was found. It was in this lay-by right by the main road. And when they arrived, one of the officers also put his hand inside of the bag and began feeling around. And as he did so, he looked up at one of the other officers and he said... I think I can feel toes. It turns out that wrapped up inside of this bag was a severed human leg. That was it, just a leg. So where the hell was the rest of this person? So upon making this horrific discovery, the area where the leg was found was obviously cornered off and the leg was taken to the mortuary to be examined further. And it was upon doing this when the medical examiner determined that this leg was an adult size. It hadn't come from a child, it was an adult's leg, a left leg by the way. They were able to conclude that it had come from a male, most likely a Caucasian male. And they also noticed that this person was an eczema sufferer. There was quite a lot of eczema on the leg, but I mean, that was it. That was all they knew about this person. Of course, they couldn't really determine much from just one limb. But something that they did notice about this severed leg was that it had actually been cut off very well, to the point where the police even thought, was this a medical amputation? The leg had been cut off for medical reasons and had I don't know, been stolen from a hospital or something and then dumped in this field. It was ultimately established that it wasn't quite a medical amputation, but it was at like that level of skill. Whoever had done it knew what they were doing. They knew exactly where to go in to get a clean cut. There was no evidence of someone kind of like aggressively hacking at the leg to get it off. It was almost professionally done, which as I said, indicated that they knew what they were doing perhaps they had some prior experience. So this gave the police a potential clue. Was the person who cut off the leg maybe a doctor or a butcher or something? They had a job where they had a lot of knowledge about anatomy. But of course, if it wasn't a medical amputation, then it must have been a homicide. They didn't know the victim's cause of death just from their leg, but regardless, it was clear that the police had a murder inquiry on their hands. So obviously, the police's number one priority in the very beginning was to identify the person whose leg this was, which unfortunately would prove very difficult to do. They took DNA from the leg and this DNA profile was entered onto the National DNA Database, but there was no match on there. So clearly the victim wasn't someone who had ever really been in trouble with the police before. So yeah, as that was a dead end, as I said, it was going to be very tricky to work out who this person was because they didn't have hands to collect fingerprints. They didn't have this person's face to be able to see what they looked like. They just had a leg, but not for long. It wasn't long before another body part was discovered. Exactly one week after the left leg was found on the 29th of March, 2009, a couple who were out walking their dog discovered a left forearm on the side of a road called Drover's Lane in Wheat Hampstead, which is again a village in Hertfordshire and it's about 23 to 24 miles away from Cotterhead where the leg was found. So the police were called to the scene and they of course immediately theorised that this forearm, I mean it, it had to have come from the same person that the leg belonged to. And when DNA was compared between the arm and the leg, sure enough this theory was confirmed to be true, the DNA matched. The forearm had been dismembered at the elbow and the wrist. So 
so it was just this part that was found and again just like the leg it had been removed very well with a lot of skill and knowledge and it was clear that the hand had probably been removed to further disguise the victim's identity to ensure that they wouldn't be identified through fingerprints. Now as you can imagine news of these awful discoveries spread very very quickly. It wasn't long at all before it was being reported on in the media because obviously this kind of thing just doesn't happen. Finding severed body parts just discarded on the side of the road does not happen. I mean it's like something out of a horror movie. So yeah there was a lot of media attention surrounding this case which was a good thing because you know hopefully that's going to get the word out more that someone has been found murdered and could possibly help the police identify the victim sooner. But unfortunately it didn't really do much for the police in terms of witnesses due to the fact that the arm and the leg had been found just ditched in pretty rural locations along quiet country roads. There seemed to be no one that witnessed the actual disposal of these body parts. No one saw the killer ditching them in Cotterhead or Wheat Hampstead. But before I think anyone really had the chance to even process that a second body part had been found, yet another gruesome discovery was made. Two days following the discovery of the forearm on the 31st of March 2009, about 100 miles away from Wheat Hampstead, a human skull was found by a local farmer in the village of Asfordby in Leicestershire. The farmer was tending to his cattle pen when he discovered a severed head in one of his fields and of course he contacted the police straight away. Again DNA from this head matched the arm and the leg so the police knew that it was the same victim. It had also been cut off very well so once again the killer knew what they were doing and as soon as the detective saw the head it was instantly obvious that the killer had really gone to such lengths to try and disfigure their victim's face because disturbingly pretty much all of their facial features had been removed. This man's nose had been cut off, his ears had been cut off, his tongue had been cut off, his eyes had been removed, even his skin and flesh had been skillfully sliced off clearly in an attempt to again ensure that the victim would be unidentifiable. I mean can you even imagine how disturbing it must have been for the farmer to find this decapitated head in this way and it hadn't even been like wrapped up or put in a bag or anything he just found it in his field as it was. Although what was interesting is that whilst the killer had gone to such extreme lengths to disfigure the victim and make them unrecognisable they'd forgotten something which could help the police massively in identifying this individual. They'd forgotten the teeth. The victim's teeth hadn't been removed which was clearly a mistake on the killer's part because as we know dental records are often used in murder investigations to identify the deceased. So the police were hopeful that perhaps they would be able to do that in this case and it wouldn't be long before a fourth body part was found. On the 7th of April 2009 the victim Tim's right leg was discovered, wrapped up in blue plastic, secured with duct tape and in a holdall bag, just like the left leg, and it had been discarded in a lay-by along the A10 road near the Puckeridge Bypass in Hertfordshire. And again, this news spread like wildfire, and as you can imagine, the public were terrified. It was just so sinister, because it was like everyone was just on the edge of their seats, just waiting for the next body part to be found, and it was almost like like the killer was playing games with the police taunting them because it was like when is the next body part going to turn up? Disturbingly people liken this case to almost being like a jigsaw puzzle. The fact that these body parts had been scattered across Hertfordshire and Leicestershire and so for that reason the unidentified murderer became known as the jigsaw killer in the press. Each body part being found was almost like another piece of the puzzle, another piece of the mystery that the police had to try and fit together and use to solve the case and both identify the victim and catch the perpetrator. And just four days after this, the pieces of this puzzle increased when more body parts turned up. And these body parts in particular would prove to provide the police with a major development in the case as they would reveal how the victim actually died. On the 11th of April 2009 in the village of Standard, in Hertfordshire, a local farmer discovered a suitcase 
suitcase which had just been dumped in a ditch in one of his fields and inside of this suitcase was a right forearm, the upper left arm and also a male torso and it was the torso that would ultimately reveal the cause of death. It was established that the victim had sustained two stab wounds in the back which had penetrated his lung and it was established that the knife that had been used was approximately four inches long. So of course this discovery just absolutely confirmed that this was in fact a gruesome murder. The victim had been literally stabbed in the back which perhaps indicates that he didn't know that it was about to happen because he was attacked from behind and in addition to that sources also state that there were no signs of any kind of self-defense injuries to any of the body parts so that further supports this theory that the victim didn't know what was coming because they didn't have a chance to fight back, fight for their life. Meanwhile, as all of these body parts were being discovered and recovered, behind the scenes of the enormous media coverage that surrounded this case, the detectives were pursuing a couple of different lines of inquiry to hopefully bring them closer to discovering the victim's name. So for example, the police decided to send CT scans of the victim's skull to experts in cranial facial recognition in the hopes that using the skull, they they may be able to come up with a computerized image of what the victim may have looked like and then obviously this image could be released to the public and maybe someone would recognize them. So that was one line of inquiry that was happening within this investigation. Another was forensic examination of the wrappings that many of the body parts had been well, wrapped in. So as I mentioned before, some of the body parts, like the legs, for example, had been tightly wrapped up in this blue polythene plastic and it had been secured tightly with duct tape. And so all of this was sent off for testing. Now, as I understand it, no fingerprints were discovered on these wrappings, which was obviously disappointing and clearly indicated that the killer was very forensically aware. They knew not to get any of their prints on the plastic or the duct tape and so most likely wore gloves. But there was something that was found on these materials, in particular on the duct tape. When the sticky side of the duct tape was looked at very closely, scientists discovered these tiny blue and green coloured fibres. There were some blue fibres and some green fibres. And the blue fibres seemed to have a kind of fuzzy texture to them, likened to, you know, the skin of a peach, that kind of soft, fuzzy, almost furry texture. So the scientists told the police about these specific fibres and they basically said to them, if you do identify a person of interest and you happen to search their address, be on the lookout for anything blue that has this kind of fuzzy material. As well as this, the police were also looking into missing people, men that had been reported missing recently that may fit the profile of their victim. Using the body parts, they had predicted that he was either a white or Asian or mixed heritage male. They estimated that he was somewhere around the five foot six to five foot ten mark. They believed that he had quite a large frame and it was also estimated that he was probably about middle aged, aged somewhere between his mid 40s to early 60s. So they were specifically looking into all of the men that had been reported as missing and that fit this profile. And in addition to that, they were also issuing appeals to the public asking for anyone with any information about the victim or the murder or anyone that may have seen anything or anyone suspicious near the areas where the body parts were recovered to please get in touch. So the police had a lot going on here as well as everything else they were also having to respond to and look into the various tips and leads that they were receiving from the public and there was one tip in particular that would ultimately provide the breakthrough that they needed. Well not so much a tip, I guess, more a report, a missing persons report. I believe it was just a couple of days after the suitcase containing the torso and the other body parts was found around mid-April of 2011 when the police were contacted by a man who had seen the public appeals on the TV and in the media about this unidentified murder victim and he believed 
that the profile may have fit his missing brother. His brother was a man named Jeffrey Howe. He was 49 years old at the time that this case occurred. He was born in the year 1960 and he lived in Southgate in North London. He had his own flat in Southgate. Jeffrey worked as a businessman. He worked in kitchen sales. Apparently he had been married a couple of times before but as far as I'm aware by the spring of 2009 he was a single man and he was described by those that knew him as just being very hardworking. He was someone who very much put a lot of work into building a good career for himself as a kitchen salesman and his colleagues always thought a lot of him. Outside of his work life he was a football fan, he supported the team at Manchester United and he was described by his brother as being quote a jovial charming character who had a heart of gold and would get on with anyone. Overall Jeffrey Howe just seemed to be a very nice guy. Some sources suggest that he didn't always get along with his neighbours in the apartment building where he lived. I think he'd had a couple of spats with them in the past. But yeah, on the whole, most people that knew Jeffrey just thought of him as being a good, genuine man, which I imagine is why it came as such a shock when he just suddenly disappeared one day. Jeffrey went missing around early to mid-March of 2009, literally just a matter of weeks before the first body part was found and when the police later received this report from his brother in mid-April they immediately were like hang on a minute, this could really be our guy. The more they looked into Jeffrey, the more they really thought that he could have been the victim because he really seemed to fit the profile. He was middle-aged, he was around the same height of similar build, he suffered with eczema on his legs exactly like the victim and experts even determined that pictures of his face seemed to match up with the proportions of the skull. So this seemed to be a very promising lead for the police. They really believed that the victim was Jeffrey, but of course they needed confirmation. Now it turns out that Jeffrey was actually adopted, so unfortunately the police weren't going to be able to get a DNA match from his family, like his brother or anything, because they weren't biologically related. And so the police turned to dental records, and eventually when Jeffrey's dental records were compared to the teeth of the victim, it was determined that they were a match. Finally, after a number of weeks of trying to establish who their murder victim was, whose body parts these were, the police had an answer. It was in fact 49 year old Jeffrey Howe. So now that they knew who their victim was, the next task for the police was to obviously find out who did this to Jeffrey and why, what reason would someone have for wanting him dead? So to try and uncover the truth, the police began digging deeper into his life. What was his life looking like at the time of his disappearance? And it was upon doing this, upon speaking more to his brother actually, when the police discovered that by March of 2009, Jeffrey wasn't actually living alone in his flat. He had not one, but two lodgers, I guess you could call them, staying with him. Their names were Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush. And as far as I'm aware, they were a couple. Despite their difference in ages, Stephen was like 38 and Sarah was only 20, they were in a relationship. And apparently how they came to meet was basically Sarah used to work as a sex worker and Stephen was one of her clients. He would pay her for sex until eventually they started actually dating. And Stephen and Jeffrey were apparently good friends. I believe they met when they were working together. They both worked for the same kitchen fitting company at one point. But I mean, Stephen Marshall had had a number of jobs before. He'd worked as a bouncer, as a personal trainer. He even ran his own gym for a period of time. And then, yeah, as I said, it was when he was working for this kitchen fitting business when he met Jeffrey Howe, as obviously Jeffrey worked as a kitchen salesman. They got along well, they became good friends, apparently they would enjoy going out for drinks together, sources state that they were each other's drinking buddy. They were such good friends in fact that when Stephen was, I think, struggling financially and he didn't have a roof over his head, Jeffrey, being the nice kind man that he was, offered Stephen and also his girlfriend Sarah his spare room. 
He even said that they could stay with him, I believe, either rent-free or just pay him a very, very small amount of rent until they got back on their feet. Stephen and Sarah began living with Jeffrey about five months before he went missing in November of 2008, and they were still living with him when he vanished and was obviously murdered in March of 2009. And interestingly, when Jeffrey was identified as being the victim and one of the detectives working on the case, Detective Sergeant Ian Sigury, when he heard the name Stephen Marshall, when he found out that that's who Jeffrey was living with at the time that he was killed, Detective Sigury just had this gut feeling, I think, that, that Marshall had to have been the one responsible because Stephen Marshall was a name that Detective Sigury recognised from his kind of early policing days as Stephen had had run-ins with the law numerous times before. I believe mainly for like drug related offences and assault firearm offences according to one report. So he really was not a good guy. He definitely seemed like someone who may have been capable of committing such a horrific crime. And I mean we know that he had a close connection to the victim so he quickly became a top suspect for the police. So on the 21st of April 2009 the detectives went to Jeffrey Howe's address, his flat in Southgate, where they found his lodgers Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush. And so the police sat down in Jeffrey's kitchen and they spoke with them. And they seemed friendly enough. Stephen seemed very friendly. He was happy to answer any questions because he told the police that he and Jeffrey were really good friends. And so the police began asking them questions about Jeffrey's disappearance. What did Stephen and Sarah know about his disappearance? and they said that they didn't know much, quite honestly. They said that they hadn't seen Jeffrey since around like February time and they claimed that he was having some financial trouble just before he went missing, so he had a lot of stress, a lot of things going on in his mind. It appears as though they were basically trying to claim that Jeffrey had left of his own accord because he was having a difficult time, so he'd just gone to get away for a bit. But they claimed that they didn't know where he had gone and that they hadn't heard from him since. They were none the wiser as to his current whereabouts. However, the police weren't buying that, quite frankly. I mean, it just, it didn't make sense. Here was Stephen Marshall saying that he was such great friends with Jeffrey Howe, and then moments later saying that he had no idea where he was and that he hadn't been in contact with him in months. That just didn't add up. And also, he didn't seem at all worried about Jeffrey. He's claiming that they were friends, and yet there was no concern there whatsoever for Jeffrey's well-being. Why is that? Is that because he knew full well that Jeffrey was dead? But some more red flags emerged when the police had a quick look around Jeffrey's flat. There were a few things that they noticed which just seemed very odd. So firstly, inside of the flat, the police found the number plates from Jeffrey Howe's car. He had a private number plate and it had been taken off of his car and was just found by the police in the master bedroom. And his car was gone, by the way. It was parked outside of his flat. His car was nowhere to be seen, which seemed very strange. If Jeffrey had taken his car and driven it away, why would he have taken off his license plate? That's illegal. But another thing that seemed very strange to the detectives was that, again, in Jeffrey's bedroom, the master bedroom, there was no bed. Jeffrey's bed was gone. Instead, they found these airbeds on the floor, two blue inflatable airbeds where a normal bed should have been. So what does that mean? Had Stephen and Sarah perhaps gotten rid of Jeffrey's bed and his mattress? Was there something on there that they didn't want the police to find? Blood, perhaps? This, along with Stephen and Sarah's behaviour and their answers to the police's questions, just really made alarm bells ring for the detectives. And so quickly the decision was made to arrest them. That same day they were both arrested on suspicion of the murder of Jeffrey Howe and this was quite a risky move on the detectives part to be honest because something that I neglected to mention is that by this point the police hadn't even positively identified the murder victim as being Jeffrey Howe. They strongly strongly believed that it was him but it wasn't until a little later on when dental records confirmed this 
so at the time of Stephen and Sarah's arrest, the police didn't know for definite that the victim was Jeffrey, and they didn't actually have much, if any, evidence really linking them to the crime. So arresting them was a risk because obviously they could only hold them in custody for so long before they would either have to be charged or released. But I think the police just thought that the risk of them trying to go on the run if they weren't arrested at this moment in time was too high. And so the decision was made to just apprehend them and they were taken to the police station where they were both interviewed separately. Both Stephen and Sarah denied it. Well, Stephen didn't really say anything in his interview, to be honest. He just said no comment in response to every single question that he was asked. Even when he was just shown a picture of Jeffrey and asked if he recognised the person in the picture as being Jeffrey Howe, he just replied with no comment. Which, I mean, again, that in itself is another red flag. If Jeffrey was such a good friend of his and if he was innocent, why wasn't he willing to cooperate with the police and answer their questions? Sarah Bush, on the other hand was a bit more chatty during her interview but I think for the most part she just stuck to the same story that she and Stephen gave previously that Jeffrey was having some financial issues and that he left of his own accord. She said that he seemed a bit lost and so he just went away and she had no idea where he was. So it was clear that neither of them intended to be honest. Neither of them were going to tell the truth anytime soon and so the police needed to find sufficient evidence to prove that they were in fact involved in Jeffrey's murder. I believe it was not long after their arrest when Jeffrey was positively identified as being the victim and so in an attempt to find evidence a forensic team was sent in to search Jeffrey Howe's flat as it was believed that the murder probably took place there. Although you wouldn't have thought that just from first glance of the space because the flat looked normal. It looked very clean and tidy. The police couldn't see any blood or anything but of course it was a whole different story when the forensic team was sent in because obviously they have methods and they have techniques to reveal forensic evidence even if a cleanup effort had been made. When the forensic team used UV lighting across the flat they found a significant amount of blood. It was under the carpets, under the floorboards, under skirting boards, beneath the underlay. There was blood blood everywhere. Well, everywhere specifically in the master bedroom and also in the ensuite bathroom attached to the master bedroom. Sarah and Stephen had clearly tried to clean up the scene and get rid of this blood evidence, but forensics were still able to reveal the truth that Jeffrey's murder had clearly taken place in his own bedroom. The police believed that Jeffrey was stabbed in his room and that his body was most likely dismembered in the bathroom. When this blood was tested it was obviously found to be a match to Jeffrey Howe. It was Jeffrey's blood and I believe it was following the discovery of this blood evidence when both Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were charged with murder. However luckily the evidence against them didn't stop there. Do you remember the green and blue fibres that were found stuck to the duct tape which had been used to secure the blue plastic wrappings around Jeffrey's body part? Well if you recall I mentioned earlier on in the video that that the blue fibres in particular had this sort of fuzzy peach skin like texture to them and at the time scientists couldn't work out exactly what they'd come from until now. You see it was quickly theorised that perhaps they had come from that blue blow up air bed which was found in the master bedroom because air beds if you've ever felt one they do have that kind of weird fuzzy texture on the surface of them. So fibres were taken from the air bed and they were compared to the fibres that were found on the duct tape and sure enough they were a match. So that obviously means that the air beds must have been in the flat in the master bedroom and at the time that Jeffrey's body was dismembered and his limbs were wrapped up in that blue plastic. So perhaps the dismemberment took place quite some time after the actual murder because the theory was that the reason Sarah and Stephen had the air beds was because they had to get rid of Jeffrey's bed due to blood evidence being on it as the murder took place in his bedroom. So they must have replaced the bed with the air beds after he was killed but before he was 
was dismembered and his body parts were wrapped up in the bag. And some more evidence which backed up this theory ultimately came from a witness. And I think this witness was someone who lived in Southgate in the same area where Jeffrey Howe lived. They were able to tell the police that shortly after it's believed Jeffrey was killed, they saw Stephen Marshall carrying a mattress out of Jeffrey Howe's apartment building. And he took it to a big rubbish bin. So that was clearly him getting rid of evidence. But going back to the fibre evidence a second, so we now know where the blue fibres had come from, the airbeds, but what about the green fibres that were discovered on the duct tape? Well, in Jeffrey's flat in the laundry basket, the police found some clothing belonging to Stephen Marshall. In particular, they found this green coloured polo shirt, which I think Stephen had made when he owned that gym. If you remember, I said that he used to run his own gym and this green polo shirt had his gym's logo on it, I believe. And when fibres from this polo shirt were compared against the green fibres found on the duct tape, once again, they were a match. They were the same fibres. So Stephen was either wearing this shirt at the time of the dismemberment or it was in the same room. It was nearby when he was cutting up Jeffrey's body. And now the police felt as though they had enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Stephen Marshall and his girlfriend Sarah Bush were responsible for the death of Jeffrey Howe. So they had the evidence to prove to a jury that they were guilty, but the question of why they did it remained what reason did they have to want Jeffrey dead? Well, it was soon theorised that money and greed were probably the couple's main motive. So as we know, as we discussed earlier, because Stephen and Sarah were going through a bit of a rough patch financially, they'd fallen on hard times, Jeffrey, out of the goodness of his heart, allowed them to stay in his spare room until they got back on their feet. And as I mentioned before, some sources say that he allowed them to stay rent-free, most say that they were paying him a very, very small amount of rent, but it really wasn't much. And Jeffrey was happy for them to do that. Stephen was essentially one of his best friends. He was happy to help him out. However, this happiness was rather short-lived because eventually Jeffrey, he felt as though he was being used by Stephen and Sarah. He felt as though they were taking advantage of his kindness because the agreement was that they would just stay for a short amount of time, but they ended up staying for a lot longer than I think Jeffrey wanted them to stay. And I don't believe they were really making any effort to find any alternative living arrangements. And eventually Stephen and Sarah just stopped paying any rent to Jeffrey. He kept having to chase them for it. And when he would ask them for the money, they just started refusing to pay him. So of course this hugely affected the relationship between Jeffrey and Stephen. It meant that they were no longer friends really because it was clear that Stephen was just exploiting Jeffrey. And so it's thought that Jeffrey probably ended up telling Stephen and Sarah that they had to leave. He wanted them out of his flat and maybe this angered them. They didn't want to leave. Let's be honest, they had it good living in Jeffrey's flat. They had it easy because they were basically staying there for free and so perhaps they decided that in order for them to stay in the flat they had to get rid of the only person that would have been standing in their way. Jeffrey. Their motive was pure greed, as I said, and this was further highlighted in Stephen and Sarah's actions following Jeffrey's death. The police discovered that after Jeffrey went missing, they started stealing from him. They started writing themselves checks from Jeffrey's checkbook. So they were literally stealing straight from his bank account. They were also using his bank account and his bank details to buy themselves a load of stuff. They did a load of online shopping and they brought themselves new clothes and other things using his money. Sarah Bush had apparently paid for a Cineworld account or something online using Jeffrey's bank card. She'd also brought herself a new mobile phone. They brought a load of takeaways and food shopping using his money. And as well as this, after Jeffrey's death, they began selling a load of his belongings just to get together as much money as they could. They sold his phone. They tried to sell his furniture, like for example, his dining room table 
label they tried to sell that and just days after it's believed Jeffrey was killed the couple also sold his car they put it up on eBay and they sold it and the police were able to get in touch with the person that they sold it to they obtained this handwritten receipt from them and on this receipt scientists found both Stephen's and Sarah's fingerprints before they sold his car we obviously know that Stephen removed Jeffrey's personalized number plate from the vehicle and it was also found that he put these number plates over the plates on his car and using them he went and stole petrol from a petrol station he filled up his car and then he drove away without paying and just as a side note when forensics searched the boot or the trunk of Stephen's vehicle they discovered traces of blood in there and when this blood was tested it was found to be a match to Jeffrey Howe so Stephen had clearly used his own car to transport Jeffrey's body parts to the various locations where they were eventually found. I believe the police were able to determine from both Stephen's mobile phone data and Sarah's phone data that they had travelled together to Ashford B, where obviously Jeffrey's skull was discovered. Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush went to trial in January of 2010, just the year following Jeffrey's death, and initially they both pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder and decided to both give a very similar defence in that they blamed each other. They decided to turn on each other, basically. Stephen started saying that he was innocent because it was actually Sarah that killed Jeffrey, and Sarah said the opposite. She said that it was Stephen. From what I can gather, at one point, Stephen admitted that, yes, okay, it was him that dismembered Jeffrey's body, but he still denied having a part in killing him. He still claimed that that was Sarah, and he maintained that story for a while until eventually he dropped the act and Stephen Marshall decided to change his plea to guilty. He actually did this a good few weeks into the trial. On the 29th of January, he asked for the charge to be put forward to him again, and this time he pleaded guilty to murder. It's likely that he probably realised that due to the overwhelming amount of evidence against him, the chances of him being acquitted were incredibly slim. There was no way that a jury would not convict him, and so he finally decided to be honest and admit his guilt, I imagine in the hopes of receiving a more lenient sentence. And this actually meant that the charge of murder against Sarah Bush was dropped. Because you see, the police had theorised that the day that Jeffrey was killed was probably sometime in the night on the 8th of March 2009, going into the 9th of March. And as I understand it, this was mainly due to Jeffrey's mobile phone data. They they established that his phone had stopped being used on this day, so they believed that that probably signified when he was killed, and it was determined through Sarah Bush's phone data that she wasn't near the flat on this day. She was staying with a friend of hers at their address, so it's believed that Stephen most likely physically carried out the murder on his own, however the police are certain that Sarah Bush was complicit. She knew about it. She probably knew beforehand that it was going to happen happened that Stephen was planning to kill Jeffrey and she went along with it. She made sure to remove herself from the flat on the day that it was going to happen but afterwards she obviously returned and she assisted Stephen in the cleanup effort, possibly assisted him in cutting up Jeffrey's body, assisted Stephen in disposing of the body part. The police now believed that that was her role in the murder. They think that Stephen physically carried it out. He attacked Jeffrey with the knife in his bedroom, stabbed him in the back twice and just left him to bleed to death, but that Sarah later returned after Jeffrey was dead and she helped Stephen to cover up the crime. So of course she still had to be charged with something. The charge of murder against her was dropped and so instead she was charged with perverting the course of justice. She decided to plead guilty to this charge and was eventually sentenced to just three years and nine months in prison for her 
her part in the killing of Jeffrey Howe. As for Stephen Marshall, following his guilty plea, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 36 years, meaning that he won't become eligible for parole until 2046. However, that is not where this case ends, because it turns out that when he pleaded guilty to Jeffrey's murder, well, that wasn't the only thing that Stephen Marshall decided to confess to. Do you remember earlier on in the video when we were chatting about how Jeffrey's body parts had been cut up, how it baffled the medical examiner and the police because it was determined that whoever had carried out the dismemberment had done it incredibly well, almost to like a professional level, indicating that they knew what they were doing, they had done it before. Well, when Stephen Marshall pleaded guilty, he also admitted that he had done this kind of thing before. He did have experience in cutting up dead bodies. He said that he used to work for one of the biggest crime families in North London, which was confirmed to be true. The police did find connections between him and this crime family, and he said that he carried out at least four dismemberments for them. He had cut up four dead bodies in the past before he killed Jeffrey Howe, hence why he was so good at it, which is just utterly terrifying. And I just thought that I would mention this next part quickly now. I wasn't really sure where to mention this in the video, but as far as I'm aware, other body parts of Jeffrey, such as his hands, and I think his facial features that had been removed from his head, such as like his nose and his eyes, they have never been found. According to one source, Sarah Bush later claimed that they were buried in Epping Forest in Essex, but they have never been recovered to this day, which is heartbreaking really, that Jeffrey would have been laid to rest by his family without actually having all of him back. It's awful. But that concludes this case. That is the shocking case of Jeffrey Howe and the jigsaw killer Stephen Marshall. A bit of a roller coaster case, that's for sure. I would really love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this story down below in the comments. Do let me know what you think. And also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Again, you can let me know down below in the comments. Or alternatively, I do have a case request form linked in the description box if you would like to go through that. Happy New Year, by the way. This is my first video of 2024, so I hope you all had an amazing Christmas and New Year. I'm really excited to be back to work and be back to posting lots of content for you guys. So thank you so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!